Okay, and there's my ding to tell me that it's 12 o'clock. So I'm gonna suggest we get started. And I am going to say thank you to everyone for joining us today for the final installment of the CCHCSP Virtual Annual Symposium. Um, I don't wanna say we've saved the best for last, but I'm very excited that we have with us today Nancy, Marnie, and Demi from, the, from Laurentian University. And they are gonna teach us today on how to partner with the Indigenous community in a meaningful and engage, engaging way in research. So I'm going to hand it over to our presenters today. And uh, before you get started, it would be fantastic if you could give us a, a quick little introduction on yourselves. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we do have introductions as a, a part of our presentation. So what I'll do is uh, when we get to the, the slides, we'll, we'll introduce ourselves one at a time. Uh, before we introduce ourselves though, I just wanna begin in a good way um, by acknowledging that the Laurentian team uh, ourselves are present, is on the lands of the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850, the traditional territory of the Atikamishing Anishinaabek and uh, acknowledge the first people of this, this territory of, uh, yeah, where Laurentian is. This might be helpful for those on the line who might not be as familiar with maybe where the Robinson Huron Treaty is. Uh, we are located in uh, to, uh, Ontario, uh, and here's just a photo of uh, the treaty regions in Ontario uh, specifically. So we always uh, think about uh, Grand Chief Patrick Mandabi who talked about uh, how we are all treaty people and I guess sometimes people think about you know who among us are treaty people but it, it's, it actually encompasses uh, everybody so we all have that responsibility for the, the truth and uh, reconciliation. Uh, and we thought that this uh, would be not quite nice to share as it does show across uh, Canada, as we know this is open to uh, a, a more national. So we wanted to sh share the, uh, the treaty areas across uh, Canada as well and, and honor those and say miigwech to those as well. And I'll let Nancy uh, introduce herself. Thanks, Marnie. Um, so, for most of you, you know me as the CCHCSP uh, site leader for Laurentian, which I co-lead with Pascal Lefebvre. Um, I am a clinician. I'm the department chair of School and Rural and Northern Health at Laurentian. I am a scientist at SickKids and ICES, and I'm also a parent. Uh, but in most of my relationships with community, what's much more important is that I am a settler. I aspire to be an ally. I think um, becoming an ally is a journey, not a destination. And I'm on my own journey to understand who I am as a Canadian. And I live and work in the traditional territory of the Tikmikshin Anishinaabek. And this is really important because although I've been here and my family's been here for hundreds of years, um, we haven't been here for thousands of years. We're not part of the original peoples of this territory. We don't have the knowledge that they have about how to promote wellness. Um, and there is a vast wisdom that is important to embrace and include in our science. And so I have sort of a dual personality in this, but the second part of it is far more important to me and the work that I do with Indigenous children. You're on mute, Marnie. <laughs> Thanks, Demi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ani, my name is Marnie Anderson. Uh, I'm Anishinaabek from Wanapate First Nation, as well as I've, I have settler roots in the French, Swedish, and Irish. Um, I'm part-time master's student, but I work full-time uh, with Nancy Young for the last uh, four years, working with the Aboriginal Children's Health and Wellbeing Measure. And with that, uh, I've been able to work collaboratively with over uh, 30 plus uh, even uh, Indigenous communities and organizations. Um, also, I have uh, other roles and other hats uh, that I always like to share because it is my passion is uh, children's health uh, and I do sit on the board for Neen Johnson Audic, uh, Child and uh, Service, Child and Family Services Agency and I sit on the, uh, uh, as a director for Wanapate First Nation. Uh, 
Uh, I'm just going to turn my video on just to do my introduction so you can put a, a face to the voice. Um, so, Ani Bojo, Demi Nebagwane, Indigena Kaz, Makumana Singh and Dunji, Mongon Dodem, Sudbury and Dunjaba, Anishinaabe Koi and Dao. Uh, so, hello everyone and welcome. My name is Demi Mathias. I am a Temi Agaba Anishinaabe Koi from Tuagami First Nation, or also known as Bear Island. Um, I, I did my master's um, around cultural resurgence and revitalization. And, and during that, I, I built a birch bark canoe. So uh, it's, it's also known as a wigwas jimon. Um, I'm a listener, a knowledge share, a teacher, and a learner. Um, I also, like Marnie, have different hats. And I sit on um, in the independent First Nation youth working group uh, as a youth representative for my own community and communities across Ontario. So miigwech for joining us today and, and, uh, and, and enjoy the, the presentation. So we'll just talk, uh, uh, just before uh, the presentation, I, I really want to bring up why the language is an, important and, and why we use the language that we do. So throughout the presentation, um, you might hear us um, use different terminology. Um, the first one is Indian versus Aboriginal versus Indigenous. Oftentimes we will use Indigenous, but uh, because of things like the Indian Act and certain policies, uh, the word Indian and Aboriginal uh, may come up in this conversation. Uh, we also have a holistic view of health and we really, um, we put the W in front of that holistic, meaning everything in those, that all encompassing um, four areas of health. And um, in our words, sometimes you might notice that we, we are, we're trying to acknowledge that privilege and we're really trying to focus on the research for the with and for us, um, not on us, uh, for, for Indigenous people and, and Indigenous children. Just a note. And our goal today uh, is to challenge our thinking around Indigenous uh, research, or sorry, about research uh, with and for Indigenous communities, that Indigenous partnership that's really important, and building and strengthening a better understanding of health and Indigenous, of Indigenous children and youth. And this is just briefly what we're going to uh, talk about, uh, including in, in the agenda, and uh, yeah, we'll get started here. Yes, so some background and history. So we thought it was important to frame uh, the history and look at colonization and, and the different treaties and policies um, within the past, you know, 150 to 200 years. So uh, the Indian Act itself in 1876 was established. It contributed to the loss of traditional governance and uh, self-determination. Um, it it, it imposed this system on us as Indigenous people and really threw us in a box to follow, you know, what, follow what the government and, and the, uh, the Canadian government and what they wanted to see and how we would act. Um, so research has shown that historically federal legislation and policies have consistently left Indigenous people in a disadvantaged state, resulting in, in many disparities of health. So the Indian Act was one of those documents. Um, and it, it is still, you know, used today in, in many communities that are not unseated. Um, and then moving forward to residential schools and the 60s scoop, um, there, this was a period of trauma for, for us as Indigenous people. There was an unprecedented amount of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse that occurred in these schools. There was a loss of traditional practices and cultures, loss of our Indigenous languages, um, it interrupting the handed down, handing down of parent, parenting skills and fractured family relationships. Um, so both, and, and as well, uh, the 60s scoop is is a period where uh, Indigenous children were taken from uh, their homes as well and, and put into families of non-Indigenous people and, and that also contributed to a, the loss of culture and, um, and what we face today. So both the Indian Act Residential Schools and 60s Scoop were part of a, the cultural genocide and ways uh, to get rid of the Indian problem. And today we face that intergenerational trauma from, from this history of colonization. So some of the issues within the Indian Act, these are just some, um, is gender discrimination, lack of trust, broken promises, land displacement, educational regulations, enfranchisement, loss of rights, mismanagement of money, loss of traditional teachings and ceremony, oppression, cultural genocide, hum and human rights abuse. So the whole document in itself is problematic. 
Um, but similar in the Indian Act residential schools and the 60 scoops, culture was stripped away of indigenous children and youth and abuse was faced as well. Um, and yeah. And so today we look at children and youth uh, within our communities and every community is, is different, um, but typically youth ranges from about 13 years of age to 30. Um, and this cannot be said enough that, that our communities are very diverse, right? So, so each of us have a different understanding of culture and a different understanding of what children and youth are in our community, whether it's Haida community, Inuit community, Swampy Cree or Ojibwe community. Approximately 25% of the population um, is in rural and remote communities, um, mostly fly in or, or available through, um, or uh, accessible through dirt road or even ice road. Uh, compared to those, you know, in cities. And then about, if you take a look at the uh, chart below, about the large population of that are between zero and 14, and then also those 65 and older. Um, so that really highlights how, how uh, young our generation and demographic is. And so I just want to touch on what intergenerational trauma is. So it's trauma that is passed on through generations of indigenous people from colonization, broken promises and cultural genocide. And everyone, um, everyone experiences this trauma differently, whether it's in the household, not having a stable home, feeling discrimination, lack of understanding of culture or the systemic racism that still persists today in, in, culture, in our culture and as well in, this, in the uh, Canadian society. So some treaties and policies. So treaties were uh, agreements that were signed between um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people back, dating back to around the 1600s all the way to present day. They were contracts binding these two groups in uh, relationship and friendship, or that's what they were supposed to be. Um, a lot of the treaties have, have uh, resulted in a loss of traditional territories, broken promises and no trust, loss of ceremonial grounds and practices, a loss of respect between these two groups, and little to no relationship with Indigenous people. Um, and then moving forward to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. This is an international uh, document adopted by the United Nations on September 13, 2007 to ensure the rights that constitute the minimum standard for the survival, dignity, and well-being of the Indigenous peoples of the world. This guaranteed the rights of Indigenous people to enjoy and practice their culture, their religions, their languages, and to develop and strengthen their economies and their social and political institutions that is free from discrimination. And so moving forward, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and 94 Calls to Action. The TRC and 94 Calls to Action is in order to redress the legacy of residential schools and advance the process of Canadian reconciliation. The calls to action are an appeal to mobilize all levels of government, organizations, institutions, as well as individuals to make concrete change in society. These calls to action focus on themes such as child welfare, health, education, language and culture, settlement agreements, governance, youth programs, media, sports, and among many others. So I think that it, it is very important that, you know, these calls are followed. And in terms of reconciliation, to me, um, I like to call it in good relations or, or reclaiming, right? So, so building those relationships and having those conversations. And so what can non-Indigenous people do to be good allies or in good relations with Indigenous people across Canada? So for me, um, I'm not a fan of the word ally, but I do like to use in, in good relations with, with each other, each, both groups, right? So it's time to listen, share, and understand our diverse cultures in a respectful and reciprocal manner. Colonization is still a reality for Indigenous peoples today. The Constitution of Canada recognizes that there are three distinct groups of Indigenous people. First Nations, which represent a diverse group of people from the west coast to the north all the way out to the east coast. The Inuit who represent the northern parts of Canada as well as um, northern parts of Quebec and Newfoundland. 
and the Métis who are, are present in the Plains, as well as in Ontario and across other regions of Canada. Each Indigenous group and community are very, very different. In Section 35 of the Constitution, this also recognizes and affirms Indigenous rights, looking back at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and also highlighting that there are 70 distinct Indigenous languages in Canada belonging to 12 different language families. I'm going to talk uh, now, we're going to go into a little bit of the social determinants of health, which uh, some of you who are listening today might be uh, familiar with already, but I'd like to uh, just talk a little bit about the uh, social determinants of health and in the Indigenous context. Um, so this figure itself is from the Integrated Life Course and Social Determinants Model of Aboriginal Health, and it really goes into how the social determinants of health affect uh, the mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual aspects of health, and as well as what types of social determinants and what levels uh, do they affect adults, uh, children, and youth at those levels. Um, so in, in Indigenous holistic health, um, land and water um, are very tied, very much tied to wellness. Um, we have a mind, body, and spirit concept, and oftentimes the spirituality piece is missed in <laughs> measurements and missed in, um, in a lot of the uh, wellness um, outreach measures that are delivered. And so making sure that we're getting all of those encompassed and the four directions of health is the spiritual, emotional, uh, physical, and mental. So the social determinants of health, um, I really enjoyed this picture and thought it was really important to bring up because I think sometimes we miss uh, what really feeds uh, the systems uh, that we are experiencing. So in the proximal determinants of health, you'll see uh, things like behaviors, um, addictions, diabetes, HIV. Uh, these things are the things that we often treat or we see in uh, when we're trying to deliver care. And oftentimes we're trying to uh, find solutions for the, these individual things. And then what we sometimes miss, and, and maybe there's some that you know are very familiar with all, with all these levels, but what we sometimes miss is the inter intermediate determinants and those distal determinants that feed into those proximal determinants. Um, so things like poverty, uh, racism, inadequate housing. Um, like as, as an example for inadequate housing, when you have not a lot of um, room in a house that might be, um, you know, a, a quite a few people staying there, it's very hard for, uh, you know, children to have space uh, to do the things that they need to do, adults to have the space that the, to do the things that they need to do, and ultimately, ultimately this uh, may help feed some of the behaviors that they're choosing uh, to, to do. And in the distal determinants, and, and really why uh, we wanted to start off this presentation today with uh, talking about the Indian Act and talking about these policies and treaties that are broken, is that this is really what, what stems uh, and feeds um, everything else. Uh, it, it feeds poverty, it feeds uh, racism. Uh, it really provides the basis for systemic racism because of all these things in play and not allowing us to have that self-determination um, and ability to, to, um, uh, to, to come out of this. So a part of this and part of what I'm gonna be talking about is, you know, uh, what is those distal determinants? And, and let's think about those a little bit more um, when we're talking about health and when we're trying to uh, make these relationships. So making sure we have this understanding. And so context is really important. Um, this is a really good book, Determinants of Indigenous Peoples Health. And it really highlights that colonization is a key determinant um, of Indigenous family health. And it continues to impact uh, people today uh, through the Indian Act and through systemic racism. Um, and one thing that was mentioned before was enfranchisement. It wasn't until 1985 where Bill C-31 started to address the, the um, uh, the the racism within the document that was a, that was towards women and so we've only just begun to uh, start unpacking these uh, systemic policies and we need, really need to think about how we're going to unpack it some more <clears throat> and so thinking about that root cause and those those determinants of health we're, we're wanting to approach behaviors like smoking rates uh, in youth 
can't just be talking about the behaviors and how to change those behaviors and um, because uh, we might be really missing the, you know, the root cause of that. There's a need to look at the root cause of those behaviors and how Indigenous poverty was developed um, through policy and our treatment needs to be focused on the treatment of poverty. Um, and it's important to note that social political context is crucial to recognize if we want to try and understand and improve the specific political factors that are affecting the health of Indigenous people. So I often use the uh, analogy, you know, when we're in a, uh, you're in a business in an office and you're having, uh, you know, there's a drip on the water that's coming from the ceiling, you know, we're going to address that drip in water because we don't want anyone to spill. Um, and we can make the best mop possible to help address that spill in that water. But what we're not addressing is where the leak is coming from and, and addressing that leak um, and, and so that it doesn't leak anymore, so that we no longer have to uh, try and mop up that spill. So I, just to try and think about it in a context like that, we really need to think about um, these social political pieces and, and policies and seeing how we can unpack those to help address um, the, the, um, the, the uh, address these things that need to be addressed uh, and then making those good relationships so that we can help do that. So going into talking about Indigenous ways of knowing and the, uh, sorry, evidence-based medicine and its relevance to Indigenous children. Um, before uh, uh, talking about the evidence-based medicine, I really just want to uh, emphasize, and Demi mentioned it a little bit before, is the very diverse perspectives within Indigenous communities and thinking about that when we're building that partnership. So Indigenous nations across Canada have different practices and beliefs. Uh, we know that they have different learning and teaching styles. We always want to start um, by listening and, and it may not take the first time listening but the second and third time to really understand uh, what those needs are. Um, different communication approaches so um, every community might have a different way to to share communication or to bring people together for example like a sharing circle and to always remember that there's different protocols between uh, communities. So these pictures here kind of highlight really what I was trying to say is the differences like they have, there's differences in art, there's differences in uh, communication styles, and we always want to make sure that we remember, remember that. Almost like comparing it to uh, Europe, you know, when we work, uh, just say Germany develops something, we don't expect uh, necessarily right away for that something to automatically work um, in, a, in Italy or in Sweden, uh, because we need to make sure that uh, you know, there's a very different nation. And just like those nations, um, Indigenous nations are quite different as well. So keeping that in mind. So evidence-based medicine in its typical form might not be the solution. So we all understand evidence-based medicine. However, the hierarchy of evidence within evidence-based medicine sometimes privileges that random control trial uh, concept. And we need to think about that a little bit. We need to consider um, that you know, Indigenous people have often been excluded from these randomized control tri trials, um, but not just the exclusion, but it, it might also be because that it might be viewed as, disrespect as disrespectful. Um, so results from mainstream uh, trials are not generalizable necessarily to Indigenous people um, because they might have not have been as involved. So we always need to remember um, those randomized control trials uh, might uh, hide the the uh, people that we're trying to learn about. So Indigenous children living on reserve are almost invisible from that type of literature. So keeping that in mind and, and, uh, and uh, moving forward with that. I'm going to talk briefly just about uh, concepts related to consent because it is important, but Demi will be talking about it briefly as well. And it's just about, you know, um, that being comfortable giving individual consent and the history behind why that comfort might not be there. Um, and, and signing a consent form might not be um, as appropriate. So those treaties that were signed was a, was a form of, con, uh, you know, a, a signature piece. Um, so thinking about uh, ways and the, asking the community uh, what might be uh, the way that works best for them. And, and an example that we could have um, for, for myself is, is giving SEMA and, and having those discussions. 
So we want to think about community-based solutions, allowing the community to come out with what they uh, believe that their needs are and that they need to, what they need to address in community. So we're keenly aware of the rejection of Western experimental designs by Indigenous communities because of uh, it really, it's the worldview that sometimes it doesn't line up with. It might not always um, be in the same line as, as Western experimental designs. And, and we're saying that's okay. There just might be other approaches that is uh, a better way to, to go about it. So the restrictive nature of some approaches is uh, contravening the uh, autonomy and sovereignty of each nation. So follow that lead of the community or that uh, or organization. Learning about the community-based solutions, build the relationship with Indigenous partners, understanding, um, understanding uh, their uh, needs as well. Connecting on the land, and I can't emphasize enough how much uh, the land and territory um, is important to Indigenous health. Listening to their priorities, developing that joint plan, and, and just remembering to be flexible and, and to, well, go with the flow. <clears throat> oh, um, sorry about that. I'm just, here we go. Demi's going to okay, start. So, oh, yep, yeah, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, indigenous partnerships and research, community based participatory research. So, looking at the four R's of Indigenous knowledge uh, sharing. Uh, respect, relevancy, recipro reciprocity, and responsibility. So these are, you know, when forming relationships with communities, these are four four steps and and of knowledge sharing that can be really considered. So respect, First Nations cultural integrity, ways of knowing and being, and our worldviews. Provide education that is relevant to Indigenous perspectives and experiences. Foster reciprocal relationships with Indigenous communities, families, children, and youth. Demonstrate responsibility through participation, whether that be conversation, educating each other, or just being a good ally or in good relations. And so, um, oh yeah, sorry, I was... And so looking at it, um, how that those four R's really connect with Indigenous wisdom as well. Um, storytelling and oral tradition is a big part of where our knowledge lies as Indigenous people. You know, it's it's about that connection to the land, to a key community, family, and is um, understanding our ways of knowing and being and, and where we come from. So all that is so interconnected. Everything we do, our Indigenous wisdom, everything is interconnected with each other. And it is shared in a good way and at the right time. You know, sharing and building these relationships should be based on the storytelling and the connection you have with each other and and all this will also continue to impact on um, you and how you walk on our mother mother earth you know uh, it does not need to be validated by eurocentric research and um because storytelling and and oral tradition is is what we know it's our knowledge it's it's the creation of of everything right um and a really good representation is the the photo you see on this slide that's that's telling a creation story and that's a painting by uh, Nora Morisot who is an Ojibwe artist who was an Ojibwe artist he paints this creation story and showing how you know the the birds and the four-leggeds and the humans and how we all are interconnected and we, we walk together and so another big thing I can't emphasize respect enough and how key that is in sharing of knowledge and understanding the knowledge that is being shared so follow the lead of the community respectful relationships are so important building a balanced and respectful relationship with indigenous partners you know none of this unbalancedness or um, or lack of respect. You need balance and you need respect in order for those relationships to really fit within one of each other, within each other. So a teaching I was given about that balance and respect by one of my supervisors um, during my master's is he said, nothing about us without us. And that's so true because you need to, in order to, you know, to work together and, and to have that research and knowledge sharing, there needs to be this respect and balance between both parties. Your credentials are not the most important thing. You know, like I said on the past slide, storytelling and oral tradition are 
are our research, you know, that's, that's how, what we know, that's, that's our knowledge. So it's important to, you know, share those stories and have those conversations rather than, you know, showing your credentials. Relationships and trust take time to develop. Um, I, I was told once by an elder that Indigenous people are getting tired of the constant research and, and so having those relationships and trust with each other will help them feel like, like the quote says, nothing about us without us will help them feel the importance in the research that you're doing and help them feel respected because of what they're going to share and have that be reciprocated for what you're going to share. Ensuring those important conversations between both parties and also understanding and respecting cultural relevancies and practice. And so looking at our distinct worldviews, um, as Marnie mentioned a few slides up, the term holistic, and we spell it with, with a W, encompassing whole, the, you know, the whole, everything, that everything is interconnected, this circular view of looking at uh, Mother Earth, of looking at our, our knowledge, of looking at how we do things. Everything is interconnected, and that is so important to understand as well when working with Indigenous people. The four areas of well-being Marnie also touched on, focusing on, on the culture, right? The spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental. A lot of times, though, that isn't understood that a lot of healing also goes on when, you know, when we just go out to our traditional territory and spend some time out on the land. The health and well-being, our health and well-being, when we just spend that time out on the land, it just, it's, it's a healing in itself. There's always this thinking about, you know, the impact of seven generations forward into the future. I also like to look seven generations back, you know, about that history, their health and well-being, and that nothing is linear. Everything is interconnected and everything is circular. Also, drumming and singing is another good way of, of, um, of healing and, and that health. So I think that incorporating our distinct worldviews and with those relationships that are being formed are so, so important. And then looking further at consent, I can't emphasize enough that in order to receive full like understanding and consent from everyone, relationships must be formed where each par party feels comfortable. That trust and relationality needs to be established. Relationships, respect, and reciprocity must be established for non-Indigenous people working with Indigenous people. You know, a lot of the times we aren't comfortable with the systems that are in place because, because it's, it's, it doesn't have our cultural practices, our worldviews. It's, it's a very Western approach. And so that is why, you know, there's this lack of trust. People might think that the data will not be given back to them or that the results will be misused in a way. As you know, in the systems, there is little understanding of knowledge and that's the fear that a lot of indigenous people still carry today you know when when mothers go in to to um to give birth they're afraid that their child might be taken like that fear is still ingrained in us today and also looking at the signing of consent forms sometimes that might not be appropriate as marty touched on remembering the treaties and how that relationship was broken Having verbal consent is, if, if needed, is, is sometimes appropriate, is okay, right? They don't need to sign, as, as an elder has said it to me once, they don't need to sign their life away. And so looking at Indigenous research, addressing issues of relevance in community and making sure that cultural relevancy is followed and understood. Respecting Indigenous frameworks, ways of knowing and ways of being. And the community has ownership of the data and results for the community uses. Again, going back to that quote, nothing about us without us. Building those necessary relationships, strengthening them, and following through with them. So some examples of an Indigenous research framework is the two-eyed seeing approach, which was developed by an elder um, from a, a East, uh, sorry, an East Coast community. It's the two-eyed seeing approach. It's based on indigenous and Western science, and it's a balancing of understanding both worlds. It's an understanding of looking at the Western lens and the Aboriginal or indigenous lens. And so we could also look at it in, in a way of balancing in two canoes, you know? It's hard for those in the middle to balance both sides. 
that's an analogy I use as, as a mixed indigenous youth. You look at it as standing in both canoes. Indigenous sovereignty. So indigenous communities often have the authority to make decisions for their members. And this is often seen as a, um, you know, people have the, the chief and councils and then there's the members uh, within that community. And the protocols of the communities and the ways of being and knowing must be respected uh, to the highest degree. These protocols uh, could vary across communities. Um, and one thing I know for sure is that there are some differences um, between, you know, the BC communities and the ones here in, in the ways and, and how their um, uh, and how their governance and how their sovereignty works. And so this is why relationships are so important is um, is, is having that acknowledgement and um, highlighting sovereignty as um, as important to health. Data ownership. So when we talk about research and we talk about partners and we're creating uh, 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 research projects and things like that, we want, always want to keep in mind the OCAP principles. So the ownership, control, access, possession uh, that's involved when working with First Nations and how that data should be collected, presented, used or shared. So the community is always uh, should own that that information, control what happens to that information, have access to it, and and so essentially, um, it's their information that uh, we as partners can help communities work with and um, and, and grow and learn um, about the information that they might be collecting or you might be helping them to collect. And, and one of the, the really nice approaches that um, I wanted to mention today is the community-based participatory uh, research. And so by uh, Johnson, Toms, and Musquash, uh, it, there's eight um, sort of steps that really highlight um, some importances and, and principles along with this community-based participatory research. Um, and so I listed them here, but I also have them here on the next slide. So recognize community as a unity of identity. That's really important. Builds strengths and resources of the community. So we really want to uh, facilitate that capacity building and that uh, resource um, building because that's where the, uh, the real help is needed. Facilitates collaborative partnerships in all phases of research. So um, we might have a great idea and we go and put it in that pr a research project. We really should be starting that idea off with the community, seeing if it's relevant and then going from there, as well as involving the community in the planning of it and involving the community um, afterwards when that information is collected. So every stage, it's, it's very important that they see what's happening and, and see what's going on. Integrates knowledge and action, and action, mutual benefits of all partners. So again, it's reciprocal, like Demi said, uh, where everyone is benefiting um, from the information and, and uh, from what the community wants to do with it. Promotes a co-learning and empowering. So it's really cool. And oftentimes when I'm reading the articles that have community-based participatory, uh, community-based research involved, uh, is that there's a lot of co-learning. The community's learning, uh, the partners, uh, if you're researchers or, or uh, doctors, there's learning on both sides, uh, which is very empowering uh, for the project. And uh, uh, yeah, involves a cynical and uh, iterative, iterative process. It addresses health from both positive and ec ecological perspective and disseminated findings and knowledge gained to all partners. So really it's, it's about um, that understanding of what the community needs and involving them every step of the way um, will bring about a successful uh, research project. And here's an example. Thanks, Marnie. Uh, so it's Nancy Young here again. Uh, We'll try and turn my video on briefly to just say hello to everybody and then I'll turn it off again. Um, so the ACHWM Marnie alluded to briefly, um, it's part of the project that both she and Demi have been working on. Um, and this is the website, um, which is achwm.ca. 
And this is an example of how we've implemented some of these principles in a series of research projects. So the work that we did began with Mary Jo Wabano. So people talk about how research needs to fit the needs of community. Um, in this case, it came from the health services director in the community who saw several gaps. And I will talk about those briefly. So she was well aware of the health inequities that are experienced by Indigenous children, and I'm sure most of you on the call are very familiar with those. She saw a need for new research, which is an interesting, um, sorry, just some background noise. It's an interesting thing that a health director would come and say, yes, we need um, more research. And she specifically identified the lack of culturally appropriate outcome measures and the importance of holistic assessment and the importance of balance. Sorry, very distracting noises outside. Uh, so we began this work in collaboration. She had come to me um, to ask me if I could support her to address specifically the gap in measurement. And so we formed a collaboration between the academy and the community. In this case, the community was Wikwem Kong Unceded Territory. Um, and we decided to conduct research together that would inform community planning. And that one of the principles that we have held close to our hearts the whole time is to always keep the best interests of the children at the forefront of each decision. So if we have to decide what to do, and there's different paths, we say, well, which one would be in the best interests of the children? And that's the path that we've taken. So our collaboration resulted in what was originally called the Aboriginal Children's Health and Wellbeing Measure. And that's where ACHWM came from. More recently, the Aboriginal was replaced by Anishinaagegi. And Anishinaagegi means, how are you in Ojibwe? Um, and that name was given to the measure by the children several years ago. The, the kids never called it ACHWM, but in each community, they call it how are you in the language, which might be Anishinaagegi, it might be Kanwipe, um, it might be Kamasavo. There are different names for different communities. And it is a strength-based assessment of health. So unlike most of what we're used to in clinical practice, which is assessing the degree of illness, this is really assessing strengths. And it's recognizing that Indigenous children, yes, they face many challenges that are historical and ongoing, um, but they have incredible resilience and many gifts. And so this was looking at the positive in those children. It was developed with and for um, Indigenous youth between the ages of 8 and 18. And it was built on the Nanashinabe framework. Um, and Marnie and Demi have both all already talked to you about the four directions and the importance of them. And it was built on that same medicine wheel framework. And it was a representation that all things are connected within the circle of life. So the measures um, completed by self-report, so children from the ages of 8 to 18 are able to complete the assessment and they do it on tablets which has had some interesting spin-offs and has been a really good decision. Um, and so that's sort of the Cole's notes of what the ACHWM is. Next slide Marnie. So we've had a whack of financial support. So this project goes back to 2009 when we first started getting money from what was then the Indigenous Health Research and Development Partnership. And we've had several grants ongoing. Um, right now we're supported from the um, MCCSS, so the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services, as well as the CIHR Pathways 3 grant. And I click one more time, Marnie. Yeah, and all of the projects that have a little purple star beside them, which is everything except for one, um, Mary Jo Wabano has been a co-lead on. So that's how we've reflected the partnership. The only reason she's not a co-lead on our current rapid response KT grant is because it came in the middle of COVID and she's a health director busy taking care of the health of her community. So the work that we've done has always been shared locally, reviewed by chief and council, and then published. So it's not that we're not publishing, we're absolutely publishing. We're just making sure that the community gets what they need out of the data before anything is shared more broadly. So what's up on the screen are the seven publications that we have on this project so far, and they're also available um, open access on our website. 
And open access is a really important decision to make when you're working with Indigenous communities who don't have access to the academic literature that all of us on the call have. So some steps that we can all take in moving forward together and addressing truth and reconciliation. So cultural competency, that's a piece that we can all do. And it is a journey, it is not a destination. Um, there is no universally accepted definition, but we have a working definition, which is an ability to interact effectively with people of different cultures. And there's four key components. There's the awareness component, so understanding where we're coming from and our own place of privilege, um, attitudes towards cultural differences, knowledge of different cultural practices and worldviews, and we're trying to build some of those today, um, and some cross-cultural skills. And so developing cultural competence results in an ability to understand, communicate with, and effectively interact with people across cultures. And through this presentation, both Demi and Marnie have reinforced several times how important relationships are. You need a basis in cultural competence to be able to start to build those relationships. And once you do, those relationships will help you continue to grow your cultural competence. So I've put a few um, opportunities for learning here. Um, though, so there are some online resources that are available um, through Indigenous Canada. There is a MOOC offered by the University of Alberta um, on Indigenous history. Um, and there's uh, Sanyas training, which is, uh, was developed in BC uh, for clinicians. And it's an online training piece that you can do. There's also several documentaries um, that um, are available. And we had a list of the documentaries on here and with our technical issues, they're not here. <laughs> but we'll just move on. We can come back to those if people have questions. There are a number of books um, that you can access and we can put the list of books up at the end if you wanna come back and write some of them down. But there are some excellence in Indigenous research books um, that Deborah McGregor, Brenda Bastool and uh, Melanie Johnson wrote. There are also um, some good articles. So uh, Debbie Martin wrote a, a nice article on two-eyed seeing that's available online. Um, but there are, there's a wealth of information. These are just some examples. Next. So I'm going to encourage you to invest in Indigenous child health, um, to focus on research that supports community priorities, that you take time to build the relationships and maintain those relationships, that you seek guidance. And sometimes as clinicians, that's not our first approach, but it is your best approach when working with Indigenous communities, to seek guidance from the local clinicians, the elders, the leadership, meaning chief and council, and the families and to always put the children first, which is not new for this group of people. So the example that I gave you, our solution took the form of a community-based research project. We created a measure that was consistent with indigenous ways of, know of knowing, but also it turns out that it has met Western science um, demands and the needs of funders. Um, and it informs local programs and practice. Next slide, Marnie. So I'm going to encourage you to tailor your approach. Think about the context. Think about the holistic approach. Aim for balance in all aspects of the project. And think about what are you getting from this and what is the community getting from this. And try and make sure that there is a, a re reciprocity there. So the ACHWM team has been moving forward in a positive direction. We have been affirming the seven grandfather teachings and they're listed here. Uh, we think about love for the children being our highest priority, bravery to try something different, humility, regardless of creed or race, respect for diverse opinions and viewpoints. And that's one that constantly needs work. Um, honesty in sharing the experiences, wisdom transferred to and from the young people, and truth that it's time for change. Sorry about the noise. So here's the website. And we can move on. I just want to end by thanking the many children and youth and elders and community members who contributed to our collective learnings. And with that, I think we're open for questions.
Should I leave it on this slide or do you want me to stop sharing while we do questions? It might be good to stop sharing while we do questions so everyone can see um, uh, uh, the faces. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Dem Demi, Marnie, and Nancy for that beautiful presentation. Um, I think from the comments that have already come in, we all agree that this was much needed and very well presented. So from CCHCSP and all the audience, let's give them a Zoom clap. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, there are a few questions that have come in over the comments. Um, I will read one or two of them and then I wonder if the three of you would like to moderate the questions. Um, perhaps I can just hand it back to you. We have 10 minutes. Um, uh, I'm available after this hour. We'll keep the lines open at, uh, at the hour. If anyone wants to sign off, that's completely fine. And we will keep the lines open. So let's start with Kelly Thiessen, who has written in uh, one learning I've had co-leading a project with an indigenous elder from Manitoba is that it's important to continue to listen and to see the work as part of actioning the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and to stop solely focusing on your research agenda, focus on the relationship. And then she also said, thank you for pointing out the process and how you're approaching publication as some academics can be aggressive with publishing without thinking through what it means for the project uh, to be community led. This informs how you publish and the process you take. So I think it's acknowledging some of the, the points that you've already made. Um, and lots of comments coming in. So maybe I can leave it to one of you to uh, address that comment and then take the comments from the, from the sidebar in the chat panel. I think it's a very timely comment and I want to just first by saying thank you uh, for the comment. Um, and I, I just want to share something because at the last second I was thinking about how I was going to share uh, one of my recent um, readings that I read um, in a book called um, Embers by Richard. And there's a part in here that I think is important and I think I, I just wanna share it. So you always repeat thing, things three times. Just the important things? Why? I hear you the first time. No, you, you listen the first time, you hear the second time, and you feel the third time. This one man said, I don't get it. She says, when you listen, you become aware. That's for your head. When you hear, you awaken. That's for your heart. And that's for your, uh, sorry. And when you feel, it becomes a part of you. And that's for your spirit. So three times. It's so you learn to listen with your whole being. And that's how you learn. So listening is, um, that was a beautiful question and comment. So I really, uh, I think it was very timely. There's a few other comments in the chat bar, um, and I'm trying to pull it open so I can see who said what without covering everybody's face. So Shannon McDonald um, commented on another book, um, which is Indigenous Rights by Chelsea Vowell. So thank you for that. Um, we could certainly start if uh, Linda um, Pears is willing to put together a list of some resources that um, people could access. Um, I think Demi's read that one as well. Um, apparently, it is a very good starter book, so I can't say that I have read it. Um, Demi, did you want to comment on that book further? No, it's just, it's a really great book. Um, I, uh, during my time as a TA, that was the book that was used in just the general Indigenous studies course. So it gives like a very general overview and, and how, just helps you understand more. So that's a good stepping stone um, to leading into some of the books we uh, uh, we listed as well. So, And Kelly has a thank you in the post, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Kelly for being with us and for your comments. Um, Shannon had a question for you, Demi, to expand um, on your comment about not using the term ally. Uh, she's heard that from someone else, but she doesn't really understand the basis of it, so that would be helpful to expand further. For sure. So, um this is like more of like my personal um, understanding and, and being uh, 
uh, it's you. Um, it's, it's definitely about uh, about being ally or being in good relations, and then also about that two eyed seeing talked about because um, for me it's it's my indigenous lens that's in one and my my in the other because because my mother my mother is non indigenous um, so for me the term ally um, it's it's not misuse but I just I just there can be uh, uh, there's that can be used for in good relations. Um, Demi, you're breaking up. I wonder if you want to try turning off your video. Oh. I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> I need to go off video. Yep. Um, and I think that um, just with the teachers I've had and just working towards uh, building those relationships, I think in good relations is, is just a better phrase to use um, than the word ally. I know I'm kind of like beating around um, the bush, but to me, it, it, um, it's kind of similar to reconciliation in the sense that it's becoming overused and is sometimes misused. And a lot of people don't understand that. So in terms of um, using the term ally, rather than um, in good relations, it's becoming more of a buzzword rather than what it's actually meant to be. Um, just because, you know, there, there could be someone that, and this is just an example, that comes to an Indigenous presentation or someone's talking or something and, and they're like, oh, I'm a good ally, I went to one that's good enough. It's like, no, like, you're not a good ally. You know, you need to do your part more and, and really understand and be in good relations. So I think that that's, to me, that encompasses um, more important what it means to to really strengthen and build and rebuild those relationships with non-Indigenous people. So I hope that answers the question. Um, okay, cool. I saw your chat. Thank you. I'm glad that helps. <laughs> There's another question from Caitlin. Thank you for this really thought-provoking presentation. This came up a few times in the background section on historical and cultural context, and I'm wondering if you can speak more to the relationship between gender and health in the context of Indigenous communities or in understanding the important historical political context. I think I can answer that one a little bit because so my, um, because of my personal experience, um, so my family, um, the history of my Indigenous family is that we were enfranchised um, in the late, or sorry, early 1900s. So what the Indian Act did was it classified and it uh, told sort of who was First Nation, who's not First Nation, and it really, it brought in the... I guess blood quantum of you know if you're 50 percent or or more and how you're passing down um, that first nation status and so for a long time women have been left out of that policy because only men were able to pass um, their status and in in some uh, i guess examples was you know a woman uh, who had children would marry a non-indigenous man she would lose her status and also lose membership to her community and not be able to live in their community anymore so she had to leave the community if she wanted to marry outside uh, or sorry a non-indigenous person and so what the um, that Indian Act was in place for so long or those rules and it wasn't until BC 30 uh, Bill C 31 in 1985 is where they started to recognize the the woman's status and then the women being able to um, you know, pass that status on to their children. There's still a lot of questions and a lot of issues around, um, you know, that because uh, there's a lot of pieces to it. So I know for sure it just started to get addressed in 1985, which is where my family started being able to, um, uh, you know, apply for their status back. So it's trying to remove that enfranchisement, but the whole Indian Act in itself um, sets up a lot of, um, 
people or in women, I guess I would say women, especially because of that enfranchisement piece and women having to leave communities. Um, also, people became enfranchised when you went to school, college, uh, when you went to war, um, things like that. So when you became a better citizen and sober, it was really neat to see my uncle or sorry, my great uncles, few greats. Um, when they applied for their enfranchisement, the Indian agent put, uh, you know, they're an outstanding Indian, they're sober um, and a hard worker. And, and just to see really the, the context around what enfranchisement means is really, um, is really where that, that some parts of that, you know, um, uh, uh, gender is where the word I was looking for, gender and health kind of come in is, uh, some of those policies. I don't know if Demi or, or Nancy have anything to add to that. So those rules did not apply to men. Those rules only applied to women. So a man could marry um, a white woman um, and retain his status, past status on, could actually pass status to his wife. Um, so the rules were very different for men and women. So Bill C-31 has addressed some of that. But there are these, these legacies and uh, related specifically to gender. And as Marnie said, most of the things that we would consider markers of becoming a, a better citizen and um, things that would promote your health. So education, we know, is associated with better health outcomes. But if you got educated um, under the Indian Act, you lost your status. So the things that would make them stronger, make them healthier, they were being punished for through the policies of the Canadian government at the time. So we're all very happy that that's changed, but it's not completely gone. And to add the forms of government, I don't know if, um, if you noticed, but there's, you know, a lot of times um, there was women counselors, there was women uh, chiefs. Um, and because of the Indian Act and this, um, impression of men uh, holding those leadership statuses or should hold those leadership status is another form of how uh, gender kind of went um, very men focused and and just now um, I'm seeing a lot more our grand chief uh, Roseanne Archibald is a woman and so these things are coming back um, but still uh, the 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 Indian Act needs to be addressed <laughs> notice that we're pretty much at our time limit and a couple of people have said thank you and they're, they're departing so I want to thank everybody for joining us and I really want to thank Marnie and Demi um, this is not my wisdom to share it's theirs and it's been really powerful to hear it from uh, these two wonderful women thank you so much Marnie go ahead do you want I'm to just gonna say miigwech, miigwech to everybody for coming I really appreciate presenting to you guys today yes it was uh, such a privilege for us to listen um, to your stories, to your uh, advice, and uh, and to end up to hear about the work that you're doing. And uh, from the heart of CCHC as an organization, uh, we really thank you. I want to learn how to say thank you in some of the the languages that you mentioned, maybe in a future session. Uh, but in English, uh, I thank you. Thank you very much from the bottom of our heart. Um, 